This video is brought to you by Blessed Be God Boutique, maker of Catholic fashionable apparel, handmade accessories, and more. A few weeks ago, I reported to you the news that the Vatican was signaling that Francis was going to issue a document to revoke Humanae Vitae, possibly the best document issued since the Second Vatican Ecumenical Non-Binding Council. This news came initially from an outlet in Italy called La Civilita Cattolica, which is the official thought magazine for the Vatican. Think of something like The New Yorker in the United States, and you kind of get an idea of what they do. And every word in that magazine is vetted by Rome before it is published. And that document told us that Francis could and should revoke Humanae Vitae, which would then formally allow Catholics to use artificial means of rejecting God's great command to be fruitful and to fill the earth. That report was met with skepticism from many who viewed it. Now we have the Pontifical Academy for Life talking about how Humanae Vitae was not an infallible document and could be revoked. Thankfully, there are scholars in abundance who actually disagree with that assessment and who say that there is an infallible declaration in Humanae Vitae that goes against the use of those methods as prescribed in Humanae Vitae. But it doesn't matter anyway, since Paul VI was only repeating what other popes ahead of him taught infallibly, that using artificial methods, including timing, to reject God's command to be fruitful and multiply is a sin. And we have at least two documents that argued it so infallibly, one by Pius XI and one by Leo XIII. And the claim that those documents were infallible in their declarations comes again from moral theologians. This news from Rome isn't that surprising, though. The Pontifical Academy for Life has been getting a wicked facelift for the past few years, and I've touched on that over the years, here and there when it would come up in the news, but mostly that those stories just didn't get that much attention from people, didn't get the attention that they deserved. In short, the reforms of for that Pontifical Academy were to move it away from the work of John Paul II, which had he had given that academy the task of combating what we call around here the Moloch ritual and culture that stems from it. And it has now in more recent years under Francis moved to a more, shall we say, broader view, one that is in keeping with the secular authorities who support Francis and his work and vice versa. Francis's work in this case to secularize the Catholic Church. But what caused this latest dust up on social media was a tweet from the Pontifical Academy of Life that stated, something you have to know, some inside baseball stuff about Humanae Vitae to really understand. But here's the tweet, quote, History records by Archbishop Lambruschini confirmed that Paul VI said him directly that Humanae Vitae were not under infallibility, end quote. You can also tell that the person who tweeted that English wasn't their first language, but that's fine. But what's the big deal, though? It's rather simple. If Humanae Vitae was not an infallible act of a Roman pontiff, or rather, if it contained no infallible moral declarations, then not only is Humanae Vitae not binding on the faithful, but it's also open to a successor that the Roman pontiff could, if he wanted to, rescind the document. In this case, the argument is that Paul VI did not make an infallible declaration, so Francis can undo what Paul VI dead did. That's what they're saying here. Archbishop Lambruschini and who he was is not all that important here. He was a prelate close to Paul VI and spoke to him on numerous occasions. Due to Paul VI being himself a modernist, it stands to reason that so is any prelate kept close to Paul VI. That's not a stretch of the imagination. What he has to say has zero magisterial authority, though. That's the important thing. What one prelate has to say, even if he was close to a pope, is rather irrelevant. The church has always taught that using these artificial means of avoiding God's great command to be fruitful and fill the earth is immoral. Full stop. It's why you see traditional Catholics and conservative Novus Ordo Catholics debate endlessly about theology of the body, NFP, and the rest of it. It's because at the core of this is the inescapable fact that the church has always had an ironclad, immovable, adamantine teaching against the practice. The modernists have wanted to change this for decades. Just a couple of weeks ago, I published on a Saturday a video on how the modernists destroyed Catholic morality, which was about the response by some bishops to Humanae Vitae that had wide-reaching consequences. They always hated this teaching of the church, despite it being something the church has always consistently taught since the first century. In 1986, a theologian priest issued a report stating that Humanae Vitae had a magisterially binding infallible teaching on the subject. 
The priest was Father Leo of the Order of the Friars Minor. He declared in L'Osservatore Romano, another official outlet of Rome, in 1986 how Humanae Vitae was infallible and thus binding. This is the case because Paul VI and Humanae Vitae used language that was rather unambiguous. <laughs> quote, according to Father Leo, quote, Re Humanae Vitae reconfirms the immutable and perennial nature of the doctrine regarding the intrinsic evil of these methods. Catholic moral truth in its immutability and perennial validity lives not only through dogmatic definitions or other pronouncements given in the modus definitorius, but also through other affirmations of truth. And these indeed are the majority, which even when they are not clearly formulated in that mode cannot be regarded as changeable, end quote. In other words, Paul VI reconfirmed what the church had always taught. And for the record, Father Leo was aware of the claims made by Archbishop Lambruschini and rejected the claims on the grounds that Paul VI knew the subject was intrinsically evil and had always been taught as such. So what is the statement from Humanae Vitae that people are saying is infallible in nature? It comes from paragraph 14 of the document, but unfortunately I can't quote it directly on YouTube because the language it employs is, frankly, too much for the sensitive types who run the place. Go figure. But the language is unequivocal. And I'll paraphrase Paul VI here. This is the language learned theologians are saying is infallible when invoked by a pope. Quote, Therefore, we base our words on the first principles of a human and Christian doctrine. When we are obliged once more to declare that these methods are to be absolutely excluded as lawful, end quote. It's not so much what Paul VI said specifically that matters on the subject at hand. It's the forceful and unequivocal language employed by Paul VI to make his point. We declare, excluded as lawful. That is the kind of language missing in any modern papal writing. Paul VI was not ambiguous, at least here. That's not to say that Humanae Vitae doesn't have problems. It certainly does and has been well established in other places. The short version of that is Humanae Vitae inverts and reverses the ends of the nuptial sacrament. But that's not all that important for the discussion at hand. Even if you think Humanae Vitae isn't binding, two previous papal documents seem to be Casti Canubi by Pius XI and Arcanum by Leo XIII. Both are said by theologians to be infallible declarations against the act and methods in question, for the same reason Humanae Vitae is said to be infallible. The Pope, in writing those documents, was repeating timeless church teaching and using unambiguous language when reinforcing it. The same goes for Casti Canubi, both of which should be read by people who are in pre cana counseling before approaching the nuptial sacrament. But what is really going on in this discussion? Why has first La Civilita Cattolica, now the Pontifical Academy for Life, in the short space of about three weeks, softly challenged the immutable teaching presented in Humanae Vitae? It's pretty simple. The modernists are going to issue a document ending Humanae Vitae. They'll do it in the name of synodality, or they'll say the doctrine is developing and, and that we have learned from science or some such nonsense. But whatever excuse they'll give, it will be the, that it'll be pure modernism. Just know that. It'll be heresy. And then you have to ask, as some commentators are asking, is Francis an antipope? Is he the first antipope the church has had in several centuries? Yes, now people in pretty mainstream outlets are asking that question. We live in interesting times. Andrea Grillo, a theologian in Italy, has said something revealing about all of this. In an essay published in an Italian outlet, he tells us that we're still reaping the fruit of Amoris Laetitia. Quote, the space of this volume, the book he's actually talking about in his article, was opened up by Amoris Laetitia, which indirectly, also for these artificial methods, establishes the end of the 19th century model. End quote. Sadly, what he's missing is that this teaching goes back as far as the first century. In the 19th century, it became salient again with the advance of technology and science, making the practice, in theory, safer, but it wasn't a new teaching then. That's the mistake the modernists are making. New teachings not formally declared infallible can be changed according to their teaching. The problem is that there's a lot more to infallibility than merely a solemn declaration of such by a reigning pontiff. And even the informal declarations have been rare since the council, since infallibility is a rigid concept from the old faith that does not fit into the vision of a conciliar, collegial, synodal church of non-judgmental group hugs and kumbaya. But Mr. Grillo writes these words in a laudatory fashion. According to the modernist view, which Grillo asserts here, the church opposes these methods for not real Christian reasons, but because the Catholic Church has always sought to control people's lives, and by the 18th century, its temporal power was gone. So it instead sought to impose control over people's individual private lives instead. 
Remember that argument because we will certainly hear more of it from the German Synod, Pastor Jimmy Martin, Sister Janine Gramic of New Ways Ministry, and all these other groups that f- do work that flies in the face of the deposit of the faith. But here's Mr. Grillo giving us the case for the church embracing secular norms on the question at hand. Quote, what scandalizes in the book Theological Ethics of Life, essentially the exit from a theology of authority. What does it mean? That the categories that have guided reflection on the subject in the last century are too crude with respect to the problem because they depend on a Manichaean approach, inaugurated only in the mid-1800s, and are affected by a political question that conditions reflection, the loss of temporal power. After the fall of temporal power, a very strong temptation was to transfer a residue of this power over marriage and the flesh. Its heart is not dogmatic, but political. Precisely on the systematic level, this theology reveals itself to be very fragile, using polarized arguments which oppose God and man in marriage and generation. This theology forgets the tradition, which is very accurate, not an opposing, but an integrating. The polar model is false, abstract and formal, since union and generation are at the same time acts of God and man, which cannot be attributed to the former without recognizing a decisive role also for the latter. As the whole pre-19th century tradition has said, especially pre-Tridentine, the generatio is not understood except in three dimensions. We are generated for nature, we are generated for the city, we are generated for the church. Only in the 19th century, when nature and the city seemed to rebel outrageously against the church, did this change. End quote. That sounds pretty complicated, but what Mr. Grillo is doing is asserting that before the 19th century, the church had a different teaching on the question. He's doing for moral theology and the question at hand what the modernists did to the liturgy. They claim to be going after an older, more ancient form of mass when they instituted the Novus Ordo, which is a total fabrication and a lie, that reasoning behind the Novus Ordo is. And they knew it was a lie at that time, but they made the argument anyway. Mr. Grillo is making the same argument about moral theology related to the nuptial sacrament and generation. Whether he is lying or not is something I'll not speculate about or accuse him of doing formally. I just know that he's wrong. But that's about it. But get ready for this argument to be refined and made more simple for the typical Catholic to not only hear, but then to repeat themselves, since already something like 80% of Catholics don't follow the teaching of the church and haven't since the 1960s, when many of their bishops and their parish priests told them that humanae vitae was not binding on the faithful if their conscience told them otherwise. If your conscience does not line up with church's teaching on something, then your conscience has been malformed. But that is what we're talking about now. The modernists never saw a teaching of the church that the world disliked that they didn't dislike themselves either. For me, it's not a matter of if they'll rescind humanae vitae, but when. When it happens, it will be done at first ambiguously, like with Amoris Laetitia. I suspect it'll be done soon, by the way, given how much they're talking about it now. But when it happens, Francis will have a statement that sounds vague that only the most theologically literate among us will catch, and a footnote that makes it worse. That will leave many bishops open to teaching as the church always taught, while some revolutionary bishops will use the opportunity to push heresy, at which point Rome will side with the latter, which is exactly what happened with the Morris Laetitia. But I'm curious if you agree or not, so let me know what you think in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't, it really does help, as does sharing these messages on social media. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.